Uh, you want me to count in, Steve? Yeah, count us in. All right, here we go. Ready? Three, two, one. Boop. Dude, mm. I it's think better every time. It does. Uh, I think Zoom uh, compressed you out once you hit that. <sighs> Zoom, it did. They compressed you out. It will. It like was a natural fade, but it really went from <laughs> it lots went to nothing. Boop. It's like the, uh, the, the technology combined with the acoustic creativity equals cottage cheese. <laughs> Dude, that was, you started off abstract. Um, right. Wow, Rachel Beauregard, welcome to the pocket. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. It's so great to see you again. It's been quite a while. Um, you have a question for us. I do. I sure do. Um, my question, the pocket, I'm understanding being like the pocket as in the groove, being in the groove. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Love that. Yes. That was my first question. And that's the where answer, the name came from. The answer is yes. <laughs> and then my second question is what, what made you all want to start this and what's your goal with this podcast? Mm, great question. Steven. Craig? Steven. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. You will, so, won't you? So we spent tons and tons of time together in the 90s um, playing music and, and living together and, and creating together. And as we started the process of kind of coming back together 30 years later, um, part of what we realized was it was so much fun to hang out with each other. And, mm. and that like the love that we had for each other as like me, Nate and Craig, who are sort of the, the, the core pillars of the band, everything, um, that that was the first principle of coming back together was that love, you know, that just it. like, oh my God, it's so great to spend time with you again. And then that expanded into um, talking with other people from back in the day. And now that has expanded into not necessarily back in the day, but just other people who are doing music and creative and, and all of that. And having these conversations that include music and, and life and, and all that stuff. And it's just been a blast. And of course, there's the other part of it, which is like, this becomes content and that content, you know, goes out into the world and does good stuff. But really the beginning of it is just the, the love and the hanging out and the just sharing ideas like we, like we always used to could. Yeah. Love that. And also to kind of add on to that, Rachel, like, you know, we had such an intense run that this is a way of actually kind of going back into that world and finding all the amazing stuff in it. Right. So mm. it's like looking at the past and like bringing it forth and like celebrating it and rematrixing it on multiple levels. Cause we were young when we did that whole experience and there was like so much beauty and awesomeness in there, but there's also like ego and mistakes and, you know, misdirection and things like that. And so just to reconnect with people, just especially during the time of like COVID where it's like, Hey, it's, you know, you really got to like, reach into the network to create those bonds again and refresh them, you know? Totally. That is so incredible because I, I think for musicians in general, and I know this podcast, the audience goes beyond people that have been in bands and have done music, but what you just said resonates so much with me as someone who kind of feels the same way. I had like a career as a duo in music. It, it moved me in, to a different city, to Nashville we had like this crazy hard and fast success and then it all ended so quickly. And it was just, it's astonishing because years later, you know, I've been out of a record deal with that particular project for several years now, but it's like, you know, there are still so many moments that I think about it, that I even long for it, that I have memories of that time that I feel like are either unsettled or I have to like work through things still. And it's that lifestyle, it really throws you into this like pressure cooker. And then it's like, let's see how you do in this crazy situation. And then it just lets you out and you're like, what just happened? You know what yeah. I mean? So I, I resonate with that completely. And y'all, you know, 
especially when y'all were in your heyday, that time period music was everything. It was before streaming. I mean, like live shows and album sales were like through the roof. And so I, I would say for y'all an even greater scale because of the gravity of that. Look, husband with the iced coffee. Hey, brother nice. Dean, what's Thank up? You. That's Shout Dean, out. everybody. Handsome. The delivery. <laughs> Handsome. Handsome coffee guy. Nicely done. With my little music note. Boop. Oh. <laughs> I know. Handsome coffee guy, great dad, and stellar musician. Stellar musician. Mm. Um, so tell us a little bit. So we've just jumped right in. I know. Tell I know. A little bit about your background and then tell us a little bit of like how we know each other. Because there's actually, you know, one thing we're trying to do is we're pulling on threads of our network. Great. So a little bit of my background is I grew up in Northern Virginia. I went to George Mason University, studied theater, got a theater degree. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> the theater to be or not to be. No. I really loved it. That's how my career started in the DC area. I was doing theater. I was doing industrials. I was uh, really enjoying my time working overseas, doing all this really cool stuff. And then I met the Brinleys that um, they own Jam and Java and another music venue in DC. And we started a band, a trio with one of the Brindleys. It was my friend, Brian Dolly, Luke Brindley and I started touring the East Coast. I'm gonna try to make this really fast as possible. Uh, touring led us to these different relationships with BMI that led us to Nashville. Once we got to Nashville, everything took off. Um, we ended up breaking up the band at that point. We felt like we needed to become a duo so that Brian and I were gonna move here because um, Luke wasn't able to move. He had four kids and uh, that was just a good splitting point for our musical career, for our direction. We, Brian and I signed a publishing deal, a record deal, started working in country music, touring all the time, lost the record deal. And then I've been, since then, I've been just kind of piecemealing these different paths. Um, my road experience led me to yoga. Um, yoga led me to like my life. <laughs> Hello. Hmm. I am still teaching yoga. I was teaching Marin Morris on the road for a year. Um, and then I got a call from the beautiful Irishman, Hosier, who asked if I would be a background singer for him. So I was a background singer for his last record, which is called Wasteland Baby, for about 18 months. And then the pandemic happened. I had a child and here we are. Woo! Craig, we know each other through Down the Hatch. That's right. Which is a fabulous music uh, festival started by our dear friend, um, oh my God, my brain, Pat yeah. McGee. Yeah. Patrick. I kept wanting to, yeah. Um, so Pat McGee started down the hatch in the Outer Banks. Craig was there as a token resident. Are you a full-time resident of? Yeah, I am a, a token and full-time resident. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, that's your rare breed, a full-timer down there. So that's how I met Craig. We bonded over yoga, music, um, the ocean. Yeah, That's we taught it. a little, yeah, we did a little yoga on the uh, beach. And so, yeah, Pat was like, hey, because I was teaching yoga. And he's like, you got to meet my friend, Rachel. She's from Nashville. And and what's been amazing about like with Pat, like we, we knew Pat on the road. And so we all had our adventure. And then, you know, Pat started doing down the hatch. And then like, you know, after 10 years, it was, it's, it's a thing, right? People come from all over. He curates really mm -hmm. amazing like musicians from all over and there's a lot of depth to it. And so, yeah, he was like, Hey, we're going to do yoga on the beach. And so you and I uh, got hot and crushed it with some hungover people. <laughs> yes, we did. And we I were like, I thought this was going to be relaxing. And we're like, there's a lot of different types of yoga. Yeah. Some of it gets there's your blood boiling. It's more relaxing after you're done and you'll be good to drink some more. But yeah, I remember <laughs> us talking seriously with you when you and I were talking and you're talking about your path and you're like, yeah, I like I have this opportunity to go on the road and you're talking about like family planning and all of that. And like, you know, true to your word, you executed your plan, which people rarely do. Like, I'm going to go on the road for a year and a half and <laughs> I'm going to start a family because, you know, a lot of times you're like, I'm going to go on the road for a year and a half. And the next thing you know, it's like five years later. And it's just like, just coming back from Tokyo and, <laughs> Nickel and like all that stuff, you know, and it's like amazing to see that you are where you are. I, I love it. 
Thanks. I, I love to think of myself as a, a woman of my word, a human of my word, but um, that honestly is just, I just feel fortunate because not everybody is able to kind of execute plans in that way, but we got pregnant. Whoop. Here we are. I've got a 10 month old. She's gorgeous. Mm, amazing. Yeah. So what was the name of the, uh, the country trio duo? We were called, we started as Deep River and then we got a cease and desist letter from <laughs> some band out of Asheville, North Carolina. And they were like, either change your name or pay us a hundred thousand dollars. And we were like, you cry cry. Mm. So we thought what a great time to rebrand. So we just ended up uh, rebranding and we came up with the name Native Run. Awesome. And yeah, and we're still, you know, Brian, so Brian and I are still best friends. We're, I'm seeing him on Friday. Um, and we just decided we're not like ever going to officially close Native Run. It's just this like ever evolving thing. And right now we're just on like a super long hiatus. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, yeah. I don't know of many other bands that, that will top our record of what was it? 13 years, something like that. A so. 13 year hiatus. Yeah. Do you guys ever get together and play? We do now. That's uh, the 13 year hiatus ended uh, with, we had a proper show. I think the, the first proper show really was at the, the barns of Wolf Trap. Amazing. Um, what right a great venue. Before COVID. With and Pat. That was, that was with Pat. Oh my gosh. And then we just had our own proper show um, in Charlottesville like a month ago at, at Festi. So that was uh, like, we're back. But You're back. It's still, it's, you know, it's kind of strange times though, still. So it's, it's, uh, and, and it, it would, it, even if it wasn't strange times, it would still, we would still be sort of inching along with it because it's, uh, like Craig said, it's, it was a lot happened back then and, and to kind of approach it in a like, hey, we've got families, we've got lots of stuff going on and, and let's make this healthy and make sure each step feels good. So just, you know, a little bit of, uh, what would be the word? Um, discretion, perhaps. Discre what a great word. Yeah. Prudence. Prudence. <laughs> Prudence. Um, so, it lately. so I have, uh, uh, speaking of, of other things, I have a company that, that Craig and I started called Light the Music. And I was talking with um, one of our interns today, Shakrana. And I, I mentioned that I was doing this podcast and she was like, oh, I want to know if I could know anything. I want to I want you to ask uh, Rachel. Uh, let me let me get her question. Like, how did the the Hosier thing happen? Like, how did how what place were you in that enabled that to happen? And how did like, you know, like for somebody who aspires to also have that happen to them? Um, what, what advice would you give and kind of tell that story? Sure. Um, I am such a believer in, uh, saying yes and showing up. And I say that with, I, I say that with, with prudence because there are definitely situations where you need to listen to your gut if it's not the right thing and to say no. But I, when I moved to Nashville, it was about saying yes getting invited to a party. Yes, I'm going to go getting going to see an event at BMI or whatever PRO you belong to. Yes, I'm going. Um, it was a hard and fast, uh, just network networking. And it is so important to be your own advocate and you have to show up everywhere you can. You have to meet everybody you can. And I say that because it sometimes is that one person that you meet that you end up getting an opportunity with. So that's how I got the Who's Your Gig is I ended up meeting this beautiful human who's now one of my best friends. Her name is Rachel Lampa. She was a background singer for Hosier um, during the Take Me to Church tour which was like probably seven or eight years ago now. She and I became great friends and I asked her, so this is funny tying in my yoga journey, but I was leading a creativity and yoga workshop at the studio where I teach here in Nashville. And I said, will you mind if you are like a, um, like a practice student and I wanna practice my workshop on you? 
and see if it flows and see if there are things that don't make sense. And she was like, absolutely. So we get together and I'm guiding her through this workshop with another one of my girlfriends and we just start talking and she was like, this is amazing. And so she was like, are you done singing? And I said, God, I, I'm dying to be singing. I, everything in me wants to sing. And she said, Hosier's going back on the road and I really think you should go out with him. And I was like, well, I would love that. Let's be in touch. And so, um, Hosier's camp reached out to me. I submitted a couple of songs that I wrote, some demos, just basically videos of me singing. And then, yeah, they were like, we want you to, to do it. So it was completely through relationship built in Nashville. Um, and also just work. I mean, if you want to sing for people for a living, make sure you're singing all the time. Make sure that you are recording or um, have great demos of your voice. Make sure that you've got a calling card. So if somebody says, can you send me X, Y, and Z? You go, sure, I've got that. Here's an MP3 um, or a voice recording or whatever they want. Um, so that's pretty much it. I, I have to be honest, a lot of this music success and business and is about relationship. It's about being a genuine, kind human being that people want to work with. So if you're an asshole, work on it. <laughs> that's kind of, you know, that's the, like. That's the yoga part. That's the yoga part. I mean, it's seriously like I, we call it. I mean, I'm just, I'm a yogi who like also like curses a lot, but um, we have what's called an asshole, a no asshole clause. And that's, ju it's just basic in the music business. It's very relational, relationship based. Um, it is a business, but it's it's based a lot on relationships. So you got to start building them. Yep. hundred percent. You know, totally. Another thing I'm, we get Rachel yeah. is we get free wisdom when we get on these podcasts with people, those constant reminders, right? Like, Don't be an asshole. Is that the wisdom that you just received? <laughs> right? you no, know, always that reminder, you know, it's, it's easy to fall off the wagon on occasion. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> And it's especially really, it's especially really challenging the more success you get totally. uh, to, to be kind. And I get that too. When you have a bunch of people pulling on you all the time and uh, it's really hard if you don't have a way of filling yourself up, it's really hard to be kind. And I get that too. So I don't judge anybody for their behavior. Um, but I know if you want to get going in this business, you really have to make sure that you're the type of person that people want to work with. Yeah. And that, that word spreads either way, you know, like Correct. awesome to work with that spreads and hard to work with also spreads. A, a thousand percent. Yeah. 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 So there are a lot of, yeah. Oh, God. I was just gonna say, there are a lot of really talented people out there. There are a lot of singers that could do that job on the Hosier tour better than I but I got the word of mouth thing. And obviously I've been working on singing. So that's part of it. You do have to be talented, but it's just, there is something that goes beyond talent and it's like, like ability and the ability to, you know, groove with people. Yeah, and that's a great, so here's another connecting point is, uh, you know that uh, Hammer is playing with us right now. Oh, love him. Right there, you go. So we, so needed, good. we needed a bass player because our bass player is Dave Slankard. You know, when we were talking about doing shows, he's like, "Yeah, man, I haven't played bass in twelve years." And honestly, thinking about getting up in front of people gives me hives. And I'm like, "Okay, you're done. Like, you don't like that's not your thing anymore." And so through word of mouth, like you know, our drummer Nate Brown is really great. He's like, "Hey, dude, Hammer always comes prepared." And he, like, you know, I was telling Steve and Nate, I was like, you know, the ultimate compliment for me as sort of a person who's up front is if I don't feel like I have to look over my shoulder unless I want to and communicate something back and forth, I was like, that's good, right? If I don't have not having to look back on what's happening back there and I can, that trust is there. Like, you know, there are bass players that probably can shred harder, or have like a, like just all different X factors, but that dude is so solid that you can just build something off of the work you do with him. A hundred percent. Right. His work ethic is so good. Like you said, it's that's reliability. Yeah. And you have to be able to rely on those people that you work with too. I mean, this is just a big character business. Yeah, 
right? Yeah. Filled with big characters. <laughs> <laughs> you betcha. So you a couple betcha. things about the um the hosier tour. Is that, am I saying it correctly? Correct. I, it's right. like cozier, but with an H. That's what um, he says. How many times have you corrected people? A thousand. Because what do you think people always say, especially in America? Hosier. Or, yeah, and then you know what they say in Europe? Hosier. Like, it's like French. Ah, mais oui. Hosier. Mais oui. Bien sûr. Mais non. That's so great. The new Daft Punk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Hosier. Yeah. Hosier. So a couple things about that tour. So I, I'm, I'm looking at, there's two threads that I was thinking about. One, um, some like highlights for you, right? Whether it's a show, a city, a moment. And then the second thread would be like, what are some things that you learned, right? Whether it's musically, personally, those kinds of things. Wow. Great Big questions. We only have how long? Okay. So first question, I, moments that were incredible for me. I started um, really enjoying eat. This is going to sound so weird. I, I took myself out to dinner all the time on this tour because we were, we travel, we toured like crazy. We were on the road for 280 days in 2019. Wow. That is really, really amazing. And it's also really, really hard, um, especially if you have a partner. It was really hard to manage our relationship. And, you know, we'd been married for a couple of years, but it's just like, trying to maintain a sense of intimacy when you're only together for that much during the year was really tough. Uh, I'll talk, I guess I can talk more about the next question, but that being said, I took myself out to dinner a lot. And there were a couple other people in the band that just became like my brother and my sister. And we went out together and we would treat ourselves like uh, we, because we were out so much, that was kind of our big treat. We would get four course meals. We would do wine tastings. We would do these, these experiences that really nourished us. Um, and nourished our senses so that we could just be appreciative of other people's art, which cooking is. Um, that was a huge highlight for me. Another highlight is, um, of course, the opportunity to play on like the Ellen show a couple times, Jimmy, to meet Jimmy Fallon. All of the daytime shows and nighttime shows were highlights for me just because that is such a, such a bucket list thing. Um, and then Honestly, just this experience with Hosier, because he's such a phenomenal human and he writes these protest songs, honestly, getting to see people in the audience bring flat their flags, whether it was the trans flag or the Black Lives Matter flag or um, the flag of their country or whatever flag they had, it was so amazing to see people be seen by Andrew's music, by Hosier's music. Um, I have goosebumps right now. Yeah, I like same. you can see my arm hair. Um, I will never forget that. Every single day, even if we were doing the same show over and over and over again, which we did because we played so much, that never got old. And they would throw their flags on stage, and Andrew would pick them up and he would hold them up and he would attach them to the drum kit or wherever. <laughs> I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> And it was just like, you could see these people like being seen and being loved and being cared for. And to me, that was like, I would do a hundred thousand shows in a row just to see people be seen. I think we're, sorry, I'm really emotional clearly right now. I think after, after having a child, this is what's done to me, but I, we're in a time of life right now. We're in a crisis. Our country is in a crisis. I'm not going to go down this path right now completely, but just People need to be seen on both sides of the whatever, whatever you associate with. Everyone is just saying, I, you know, what what I am trying to stand for matters. And a lot of these marginalized groups are drawn to Andrew's music because for so long they've been abused, abandoned. And Andrew's music says, come, all are welcome. I see you sing along. Um, you're part of my family. And he would stay after every show and talk to anybody that stayed after, even if they were waiting outside for three to four hours. Um, so that's that. Yeah, that. <laughs> that's big. That's, it was, I mean, that's it. I, I just can't even, yeah, I can't even tell you on, you know, no, nothing against country music because I know country music does that in its own way, but like I, that was new for me, kind of stepping into this world of Andrew's music and of how he used his platform 
um, that's something, you know, I, I was excited to get away from kind of the party music and, and get to this real stuff, this real grit, you know? Yeah. Like, like, uh, I just watched this documentary called This Is Pop. And um, there was a, a series, a, like a, one of the episodes was on, I think, protest songs, or I, I don't remember the title of it. Yeah, and, I saw it. Yeah. yeah, it was, and it was so well done. Uh, the the series is great. Um, and and I was like, why is, like, I'd, I had I had not connected Take Me to Church with the concept of, love is love and the way that religion has sort of drawn lines around certain kinds of love that that's okay or not okay that that was it was throwing all of that up in into the air and and that that um the way he talks about it on the on the the that episode is just so powerful and and like that's i was getting goosebumps when you were describing that because that's exactly the thing that music can do that he is intentionally doing that he's connecting people and and these are are marginalized people where where there's such power in connecting those people that that that's are right. like yes this you that's know that's right and it's that's just beautiful that's right because there are a lot of people that say um i love you but you need to change uh and look there are we all have areas in our life that we can change, that we can improve, and that is life's work, right? But I think that what Andrew's music is essentially trying to do is just saying exactly where you are and who you are right now, I see you and that's amazing. And like, it's not about, yeah, and especially with the, with the church in Ireland and how they've treated people that are homosexual or, I mean, there's like a whole, other, you know, Andrew could talk your ear off about how the church in Ireland has been so hurtful to so many people. Um, and I am a religious person. So it's really hard for me to hear that because the church is supposed to do the opposite. It's supposed to be outreaching with love, with compassion, serving people that need it. And it's done the opposite. And so that song was, that's why it blew up because all of these people were able to go, this is my anthem. And now I have an anthem, whereas before I was being humiliated or worse, beat up or, you know, like that video, the, the music video for Take Me to Church, I recommend everyone seeing it. It is so powerful. And actually Andrew's brother directed it. Um, but it just gives you kind of this glimpse into what a lot of people go through who, um, yeah, who are of a different sexual orientation. And it's powerful. I'm glad yeah. you saw that. It's so good. That's such it a good is. episode. Super uh, shout out. Um, but yeah, if, if you haven't seen a series called This Is Pop on Netflix, you should check it out. Yeah. And so before I talk with you, Rachel, like I was in that classic, like I knew like this much about Hosier and I know the song and, you know, it, so much of culture, it's just, it reminds me of like growing up, like, you know, you, there's the music you're into with your friends and then there's other music that like when I was so on the seventies, us coming up, it was like, like Zeppelin and Hendrix were associated mm. with the, with like the burnouts, right? The smoking weed. And you're like, you know, they would, they would spell Zeppelin wrong or whatever. And you, <laughs> these judgments are like, that's not my jam. Like I'm, I don't listen to that kind of music and not until I got a little older and we were in the band and I was really listening to it. And I was like, Oh, you know, and it's the same for any kind of music, like where you start to, you hear a sound and you go, okay. Yeah. And with culture, right. And the way that you just encounter stuff, like I was in Staples yesterday and I was like hearing all this, like music from the eighties and my mind starts to track it. And I'm going, oh my God, I, it looks, I'm going down all these threads of like, here's all this eighties music that I'm trying to keep track of. And the brain gets overwhelmed. And like, so what I knew about Hosier was like that, it was like a dramatic sound and this feel to it. And I, and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to put that in this category over here of being that like romantic, you know, gothic something. And I just kind of put it on a shelf. And then you were telling me about like, oh, this, this is who I'm going to go on the road with. And then watching your posts about what you were learning. And I was like, man, I don't know anything about this dude and the music. And it's like this yeah. conversation right now, like the people that we're connected with that thread of understanding starts to open up more. And that's another reason why we're doing this podcast. It's like learning and adding depth to things 
because we're so inundated with culture right now, right? We're so inundated. You can just get your mind blown. You can turn on Twitter and watch something totally inspiring or totally atrocious. And so to have these personal connections to learn that, I think is really incredible. You know, yeah. like just right on. humbling. It's totally humbling. And you, but speaking of romantic, gothic kind of, he does have some of the most romantic songs also that, you know, I always pop them in my playlist. My other, my dear friend, Kristen, who's the other background singer on this tour, she'll come to my class and then she'll be like in Downward Facing Dog and like one, the, one of who's your song will come on and she'll go. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, wink, wink. Because some of his songs, he, you know, he has this ability to write some of the greatest protest songs. And then on the other side of it, he's like got these incredible love songs that are like uh, just, yeah, a little gothic, a little dark, but there's this beautiful line of just, it's just romance. It's and great. And like, I'm not even great. saying I'm correct. I'm just saying you have the brain when you're just inundated with the music and it's coming in and you're like, okay, I've heard this a few times. I got to categorize it and figure out, are those my people? What's going on? I, I'm overwhelmed anyway. Let's, what's next? Totally. Totally. <laughs> and sometimes you may even listen to music and not like it when you first hear it. But then when you do go and kind of understand it or where it's coming from, and then you're like, Ooh, now for some reason I really like it now, you know, or, yeah. or the opposite. You might love a song when you first hear it and then you might like listen to the words and be like, mm, this, this makes no sense. So then you're like, okay, bye, you know, but that's, take, that's the thing with music. It has all these different levels and layers. Yeah. Take me to church feels like uh, almost like a Trojan horse or something where it was like, it's this beautiful pop song. Like the, the, the way I heard it and the way I always hear music is, lyrics second like i always hear the music and the production and just like how it makes me feel first and and so that was just like oh this is a badass song this is like the first time i heard it it's like this is going to be a, a huge hit song this is amazing it's not like anything i've ever heard before it's just it's it's amazing and and he's delivering you know like just all of it and then to to find out later Oh, and, you know, and, and I think that's, uh, I love that because it's, it's like the best kind of protest song where it's like, it's just a pop smash and guess what, you know, it has this message that, that like being homosexual shouldn't be a reason to be ostracized or, or, or not loved or, you know, like or wherever, abused all of that, you know, yeah. and, and where you fall, uh, you know, like I, I'm super open. I, I grew up Mormon, so I'm super open to a lot of different beliefs, but like, wow. but like you said, any, especially any Christian religion should be about love. I mean, if, right. if, if you're following the teachings of Jesus, then a number one, like love everybody, you know, that's right. And also love everybody, but allow everyone to be their own person and to be in their own, on their own path. And I think the problem right now is kind of what you were saying a little bit, Craig, is that we want to categorize everything and not just music. We want to categorize people. And then what, what doesn't look like us or feel like us, or is what we can say, we'll make up a word unnatural or whatever. We become fearful of the other. And then we start to make up lies about the other. And until we can break down those borders and say, you know, whatever happened to like the red and yellow, black and white, he is, pre they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves little children of the world, but it's like, we can sing all those songs and they, they might be like, oh yeah. But then when it, when rubber hits the road, it's like, no, 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 we're not going to act that way. And we're going to ostracize and be afraid and condemn. Um, it's just like, I, I mean, if I can do anything with my mission in the world, it is just to reach out with hands and arms of love um, and acceptance. And that's what people aren't getting today. And that's unfortunately where we were bombarded with, uh, with the opposite of that in so many ways. Love is fighting though, you can feel it. Love is fighting, it will win. Yeah, and, and I think love will win. And I, I think it's, it's funny because as we've kind of gotten back to normal-ish that um, having conversations with people at like my kids swim meets or at a party I was at that like having face-to-face -face, like real conversations with groups of people, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. Like we agree on so much more than we disagree on. And I saw something you posted up on Facebook six months ago and it was kind of outrageous, but like 
you're my neighbor and, and like, yeah. you know, our kids are swimming together. And like, when we start talking, it's just like, there's so much more connection than there's, than there's like that stuff. And I think that like, there was this perfect storm of like social media and what's going on with social media, where it really rewards outrage right now. Yes. And then like everybody hunkering down so that there was so much less face to face. And it's like, and then, you know, obviously the political stuff that, that was going on and still is, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting times, but man, if, if one thing can, if two things can save it, it would be music and love. Totally. 150%. Yeah. <sighs> well, yes. I'm glad we figured that out. All right. Good. Thanks I know, for coming. That was literally, yeah, exactly. That's it. I'm out. No. Um, <laughs> there were actually, there was another part of that question and I didn't even get to it because I just felt like this was a, this was a nice, uh, I needed to make sure that Hosier got such a shout out for that, um, for, for his music and for Amen. his impact. Um, because musicians have the opportunity to do that at that level and not everyone, um, not everyone is doing it, but. Well, it's about your moments on the road and then also what you learned. And so I think we've, we've kind of got. We covered it. Yeah. What are some cities in Europe that you loved? Any places of kinship? Because one of the things that I remember about the road or like the relationships, the music and the moments, but then the places, right? And there's so yeah. many places that I have this like, like relationship and romance with, um, what about you? Great question. Well, Ireland would be the first one. I spent probably a, a total of two and a half months, three months maybe there over the 18 months. We did all of our rehearsals in Ireland and um, did a lot of shows there. Um, so Ireland, no, Northern Ireland as well. I mean, I, there was so much, there's so much about that country that is so beautiful and so joyful and so broken. And I feel like I related to so much of that. Um, other places I really loved. First time for me going to like Norway, Sweden. Mm. I was fascinated by those countries. There is, they're so clean. <laughs> um, the people were so kind. The Denmark was one of my favorite places. The catering was the best. And, I always remember the food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would probably say that. I mean, if I, I would love to go back to Denmark, and I would love to go back to Scandinavia. And if, yeah, if I were to ask you what was the best meal, like the the moment, the the ambiance, the food, pick one. Wow. So. It would be pasta, and I'm trying to think of where. Interestingly enough, I, I'm about to release a book of poetry of poems that I wrote while on the road on the Hosier tour. And I have a section in this book of photos as well. I've kind of interspersed photos. My husband's helped me. He's got his MFA, so he's kind of like, he can do the, the artsy schmartsy stuff. But uh, I have literally like five pages in a row of just pasta dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I love homemade pasta. That is my love oh, language. Yeah. And oh, so Denmark would be, there was a restaurant I went to a couple times there. Um, and I don't, I can't remember where exactly, but homemade pasta, um, Australia. I was in Australia and I went to an Italian restaurant in Australia and I went by myself and I just have this vision of how delicious the pasta was there. It was like a bolognese, homemade noodles, can't go wrong. So that's, it's hard to say there's really not one moment I can remember. I just recall eating pasta like everywhere. <laughs> nice. Do you have pasta poetry? <laughs> That's what it, I should just have called my book pasta poetry. <laughs> it's called road mouth actually, but uh, that should be the tagline road mouth, uh, a, a, a collection of pasta poetry. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. A noodly, a noodly experience. What did you learn musically in that 18 months? Um, I learned how to care for my voice. I'll tell you that much with that many shows. Oh God. Yeah. I learned how to play a rolling pad with two drumsticks. You would appreciate that, Steve. I did like, I had like a really fun moment in one of the songs where I would like, da -da -da, like do this whole like drumming section and 
that was super fun, but it took a lot of practice because yeah. rhythm on one of those things, there's no like, boom, there's no like reverberation. Mm-hmm. It's just like you hit the rolling pad and it's like, that's the, that's it. Yeah. There's no grace. There's no, uh, no there's no like, Oh, you're a little bit off, but that's cool. Cause it's a drum head and it's, yeah, just, it's oh, rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just like, this is either correct or incorrect. Cor- exactly. And so that was, I had to learn rhythm like I have never done before in my life because there was like you said there's no forgiveness and even now I can look at some like live performances and hear what I was playing and go close Rach you were close so close. <laughs> so close. it's live <laughs> I'm like at least your energy was great <laughs> yeah there you go seems like a great opportunity for some sort of a, a, a April Fool's prank where you just swap the samples out and you get your air horn in there and it goes yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> We, we, actually had, <laughs> we had one sound that we called the sex weasel because you <laughs> you like hit it and it was like it like had this weird like it sounded like a weasel weasel sex i don't know if that makes sense but that our drum our drum tech we had a good we had a couple good jokes about the sex weasel i think he did actually he might have re- reprogrammed it at one point so that everything was the sex weasel <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> The sex weasel. The side sex weasel. Side project. Good band name. Great yeah. band oh. name. Write it down. Look out. Someone's taking it. I guarantee yep. there's some band, yeah. probably in Scandinavia, that has that band name. <laughs> there was a, uh, wasn't that your, uh, si- like your band growing up in uh, Crofton, Maryland, Craig? King Weasel? We were King Weasel. Yeah. Oh, King Weasel. Listen, you guys you should use this sample as the, if you guys ever get back together. <laughs> yeah. We played like one, we were a cassette tape band back in the day when there was four tracks, like we had like a double album, like 180 minutes of pure indie four track emo. Prolific. Yeah, like hand drawn, walking around, giving a few out. There's like eight people have it. <laughs> totally like, was it Was it two cassettes or was it one of the long, like, you know. Super long, bro. Yeah, 180 minutes cassette. Oh, just 90 aside. Just, Isn't that just an amazing way of making music though? Like thinking about going and just going to a recording studio and recording just like hours of live music and being like, here's your tape. Yeah. This is it. That's it. Yeah. So awesome. Zero curation. Mm-mm. Like here it is. Here. That's it. Everything, every song now is made in like little microsecond increments that you just smush together and then smooth it out. Right. Right. Different. Six seconds of hook, let's do it. Yeah, I know. Uh, but I'm guilty though, I love those songs. I'm like, damn, that's a great, that's a great pop song. That's a great hook. <laughs> yeah, it's a great work, feel. Working with uh, kids, it's, it, it keeps getting shorter and shorter. It's, uh, I think Craig and I have this, this uh, long expressed goal to eventually end up in just mnemonics, you know, just like little, just like, weep, you know, like that's it, pay us. <laughs> But uh, but we're getting there. I don't have an attention span. We've got to work on that, people. We've got to work on our attention spans. <laughs> yeah, so, but at the same time, people like can listen to books on tapes and three-hour podcasts. So, like you know, it's like we're not focused until we're hyper-focused. That's right. That's true. You can binge watch ten hours of Netflix. Right. Just a matter of like, it's a matter of the psychology. Yeah, it's a, it's awesome. It's it's a good point. I could watch ten hours of Netflix. Yeah. Been there, done that. Um, Rachel, what do you got going on currently? Currently, I um, well, I said I'm releasing this book of poetry soon, which I'm really excited about. I, I'm not even going to say like I'm a poet because people are like, oh, I didn't know you wrote poetry, and I think mm, I don't but I'm also not trying to discredit poets by releasing this book of poetry. (laughs) But what happened is I needed a creative outlet on the road. So I started doing these creative writing exercises and then I've just edited those pieces down into, into poems. So it's about 84 pages. It's called road mouth. I worked with my husband to kind of curate a selection of photos that I took and that he took while I was on the road. Um, And then I have a friend named Holly Mayer who did the cover illustration and is fantastic. So I'm doing that. I just uh, launched a pop-up children's consignment shop with a girlfriend of mine. Um, This is just a super side project. I had a college professor, quick side note, who said, um, 
if you don't see it out in the world, like make it, go do it. Um, and that was, I'll never forget that because she wrote these one woman shows and she wrote this one about Rachel Carson, who was kind of like that huge environmentalist uh, in the 60s and 70s. And then she also wrote one about Mother Jones. And so I remember going to see her in these one woman shows and just being astounded. And I remember asking her like, why did you do it? And she said, cause it hadn't been done. Cause nobody had done, nobody had written anything, a, a show about whatever. And I just thought, huh. So long story short, my girlfriend and I were like, man we could really use a children's consignment clothing shop not only to, to be more affordable but more sustainable for our planet. And so it's called All True Kids and we just launched that today actually we just posted about it so we have our first pop-up event in august congratulations wow. thank you um and then to be completely frank with you i am job hunting i'm looking for an off the road job that would allow me to stay at home with my daughter and um, i still want to work in the music business so i'm kind of interviewing for different positions that would allow me to stay working in music because mm -hmm. i'm so passionate about it but Mm, not I'm no longer interested in being on the road for months at a time so big lesson could, there right which is like yeah. being creative and diving into different parts of your talent to have a healthy life in the world and be in music because it's like being prepared to be helpful to make something happen to make a difference in somebody's life that's right. Owning your, your voice, you know, cause it's like, you know, it, it, we're Steve and I are, are Gen Xers over here and <laughs> I, you know, we still have some friends that are just killing it in the music industry and they're managing acts. And I've watched them manage the up and comer who then turns into their late twenties and then they're not the hot young thing anymore. And then they become a legacy act. And then, you know, we've seen like, I mean, look at the yeah. Chris Cornell's of the world who they just, they lose their way, right? They something happens and they're having to reinvent themselves, but they still have a bunch of cash and they can go out and people will see them. And so, yeah, it's like that reinvention. That is like also what this podcast is about, right? Which is like, Hey, you're always changing. Yeah. You have these talents. At some point you'll be the thing. Some point you'll help someone be the thing. And then the, all that shifts. So that's super cool that you're doing that, you know? And That's right. And the thing is, is like, because I'm so passionate about music and because I am a musician, I'll never stop doing that. I'll never stop singing. I, you know, I want to be able to sing on records and I can record and do those kind of things anytime, whether it's background vocals or whatever people need. And that kind of stuff I hope to keep doing until I can't sing anymore. Yeah. Um, those are, you know, that stuff that I just, I think you know, I'll never lose that desire. And, you know, even if there is a point in my life, maybe where I do want to go back on the road, um, I love that too. And I'm so open to that. But like you said, we've got to be, we've got to be able to kind of hold this industry and this business loosely to make sure that we are maintaining our spirits and maintaining our way in life. And for me, as soon as I had a child, I was just like, it's not about me anymore. It's about us. And I know there's a lot of people that can make it work being on the road and, um, and like power to them truly. I think for me personally, uh, we, need a, we need a better way in this industry to allow parents to be good parents um, in person. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and that's kind of what I hope to do. I hope to partner with companies that are working to find sustainable ways for artists to tour, but they don't have to tour their entire life away because music is streamed. So that's, you know, that, and that's like a whole other conversation because streaming on, in so many ways is incredibly powerful and it launches so many careers when you can just listen to whatever you want on Spotify. I do the same thing. I love Spotify. I love streaming platforms. However, artists have had to tour their asses off to be able to make the amount of money back that they're not getting from record sales and from single sales. So what my hope is, is to partner with a business, whether it's a tech company or other, that is finding creative ways to supplement income uh, for musicians, for artists that can allow them to get off of the road some. Um, maybe that means like streaming platforms, uh, like video, like kind of crossing over what we had um, during COVID into 
into now and combining that. So we have live show. We also have virtual experience going. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways of doing it. For me right now, it's just teaching yoga. I'm trying to bring that awareness to people. So yeah, there's a, I think in the music industry right now, there's this huge opportunity to figure that stuff out and, and that content and creativity is is seeing this like sort of renaissance and and that um there's a, a video out by um jack conti the uh, founder of patreon who talks about like this coming wave of companies supporting creators and the big platforms you know competing with each other to support creators and so there's this it's really exciting right now that i think there is this wonderful opportunity especially for musicians who over, you know, over the course of our careers, it got, you know, we could back in the, in the, in the early days, we could sell our music, you know, like that was a thing that we could do. We sold 30,000 of our own CDs yeah. just <laughs> at our shows and, and like mail order. And yeah. that was like, that was real money. And so like that's, that's gone away. And, and the artists that I've worked with, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, that wasn't really an option. It was like, I'm going to make this music and I'm going to put it out there. And then like, hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll make it back at shows and, and merch. And it's like that, I think that there's this wonderful opportunity for that to change. I yes. think that, um, and, yes. and, you know, the creativity that will be in that, like, what does that look like? Is it, is it Patreon? Is it, you know, these, all these other different ways to do it. So if you could wave a magic wand, what would be this job? What would, what would, what would you get paid to do? Oh, that's such a great question. Well, I'll be totally transparent. I've been looking into right now a, a tech company um, that would, that is a live streaming tech company so that they're building the technology to help artists do more of that. That's, and, and I'm not going to say like, oh, that's my, that's my like end game dream job. It's just that I want to be working in music in a way that helps elevate artists and their artistry, but also can, can encourage a sense of balance in their lifestyle. So that's kind of like, you know, the yogi in me and the musician wanting to like come together and find a way of, you know, because like when we were talking about with the Hosier music, like music, can, music and love will change the world if, if we are allowing it, but, but we can't expect artists to operate at the levels that they've been doing for, for so long. I mean, that's where you get into substance abuse. We talked about Chris, that's when you get into, you know, broken family life because they just never see each other and all these other things. I wanna be able to, to figure out what can, what can I do? What kind of job can I do that can help artists have a sustainable career, but also encourage healthy lifestyle on and off the road. So you, you'll tell me, anyone listening, if you got a job out there, that would be great. <laughs> Cause right now, you know, I'm, I, I am still enjoying singing when I can, teaching yoga, piecemealing, but I'm really, I'm, I really, this is something, this is something that's been on my brain since COVID that I'm really excited about trying to do. I don't know if I get something soon. If I well, get I a love lead. That. I love the spirit of it. And, you know, I think yeah, that, manifesting, that, put it out. Yeah. Just yeah. saying it and, and believing in it because like, you know, I spent some time in LA as a, in my thirties doing like post-production and I ended up leaving cause I was like a train wreck, right? I was having all kinds of like substance abuse issues. And I yeah. was like out in LA and I was just like, Oh, this town, like I'm a dime a dozen, like a guy who had a hit song and is now like doing some post-production job and it's like yeah. totally stable and I was like I'm you know you're just making this garden of instability and it's like well that's not really helpful right oh you know? like and and it's so cool that you're saying that because like you know especially be, you know knowing being a parent and like wanting to be there for your child but still having all this talent and you know I don't think we've said yet so anybody listening Rachel is a badass singer like <laughs> didn't say that yet but that's like you know that's thank you so much it. yeah so thank um, you. you know props to that and uh anything else you want to talk about steven i just you know on the subject of of streaming and the, the only the only question i have about streaming was for me as a musician not having that energy of the audience was such a 
it was such an obstacle for me. Like, and, and so I wonder about, I don't know what the answer is, but I wonder about how that works so that it feels good to play. Like you have that, that mm. same feeling of playing in a room and the energy in the room, you know, like that's the thing that's how it's, it's uh, it comes from a, a, a desperate need for external validation, but like, well, it's not even that. the need for validation is that it? it's an exchange of energy. Oh, that's totally. just real. That's just oh, physics. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you play in front of a live crowd, there's no doubt that there is an exchange of energy that is feeding both the audience and the artist. But I think with, with streaming stuff, what I think we can start doing is doing li like streaming live concerts, live shows, so that we're combining. So it's not just, we're gonna play two cameras, but it's, we're gonna sell out this venue or this festival and also have this component of streaming so that there can be greater reach to fans so that there can be more um there's a lot of companies doing this right now by the way mandolin is the company that i've been doing a lot of research into that i love there's a lot of shows there veeps is a live nation version of that and there's a bunch of other um options but what it does is it's just saying how oh, do you are you a hosier fan and you live in brazil um well when hosier plays ireland a hometown show you can stream the live show and it'll be It'll have incredible technology, great quality. Because what happened over COVID, we saw all these artists trying to do Facebook Live or Instagram Live and it sucked. Right. Like I remember watching one of my favorite songwriters do it and I just had to turn it off. I was like, this sounds terrible. The guitar sounds terrible and everything was, <laughs> and I hate to say it, but I was just like, not worth it, not worth my time. But now we have the technology and we can be back in person again so we can do both. The artist is making extra income there so that they might not have to do five shows they can do three um yep and also give other artists opportunity to play venues because there's more space for them to play as well so i don't know i just i see i want to be a part of the shift of the music industry right now we saw a huge shift after spotify and all these things came so that artists had to just hit the road way more twice as much three times as much to make a living now I can see us moving in a direction where we can figure out ways that artists can tour less, but still have the same impact and still connect with fans. And that's going to help everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And that um, connecting with fans thing, we, the show that we just did uh, with Festy was live streamed and we did it in a, like in a zoom. And so there were all these people that they had a, a big monitor in front of the cool. stage. We could see them, you know, and, and cool. like, I think that's just one baby step towards what might be interactive with those fans and ways mm. to like make it, you know, juicier and juicier as a, as a user experience for people that are at the show, for people that are watching and for the, the artists. So, yes. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's great. You can see all their faces, see them bopping along. Totally. Yeah, we had we had one. Uh, so we're playing in Charlottesville this show, and we had somebody that was at Red Rocks. Like they were going to something at Red Rocks, and they were like there at Red Rocks. So like just it was okay. like, oh, how about that? So yeah. good. Yeah. So cool. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Awesome, you guys. Anything else, Rachel? Y'all, I don't think so. I've really enjoyed this chat. It seriously is such a joy to, to talk music and business and life. Um, that's it. I really appreciate you guys uh, for having me on your podcast. The pocket is deep. <laughs> <laughs> Going deep in the pocket. That's what we just did. <laughs> We'd love to have you on again in the future and just sort of see how things go because I've found that these conversations are really the beginnings of things. Cool. Um, love that. Like the complete thing because it feels like we touched on some things that we could go further in, like more musical stuff with you on the road, what's happening with what we've just talked about. Um, we didn't even really get to like what the new Nashville is like, right? Oh, yeah. Well, have me back. We can do a part two. <laughs> yeah. Follow Let's up. Do We'll see, we'll check, check in on your book sales, all of it. So yeah. where can one get a hold of uh, Roadmouth? So follow me on Instagram, Rachel Beauregard, um, because I'll be posting everything there. And I also have, it's called, on Instagram, it's called Roadmouth Book. So you can find my handle there and I will have um, 
a link that you can purchase the book um, as soon as we start pre-sales, which is going to be probably in the next couple of weeks. We've got everything. We're wrapping up the design and everything already. We've got a print shop out in New Jersey that's going to be printing copies for us. And then, so we'll start pre-sales pretty soon. So find me, Rachel Beauregard, and also Roadmouth Book on Instagram. And then the link will be there shortly um, to buy this book. And I'd really appreciate it. You'll get to, you'll kind of be inside the mind of a tourist, of a musician, of a traveler, of a, a lonely heart, and also a very full heart. Bravo. Yeah. Bravo. Nice. Pasta. Like linking it together one noodle at a time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's an ode to, ho- to handmade pasta. A stream of consciousness made entirely of interconnected noodles. That's right. Mm. Yes. There it is. Dude. Choose your own sauce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so uh, great to meet you, Rachel. Thank you so much. You too, Steve. How wonderful. Thank you guys for having me. And we'll talk soon. Awesome. Mm-hmm.